started. Um, you know, we've got some people signing on still, and uh, we know they'll it'll just take a minute for someone to get connected. Uh, as you're signing on, say hello in chat. Let us know what organization you represent. But I'd let, my name is Lisa Johnston. I'm the administrative coordinator for COSA, and I'd like to welcome you to today's shop talk. And our shop talk is with Apex. And so we're delighted to have them as one of our major sponsors and sharing a little bit of information about uh, their products and what they do. So today we're just going to have the presentation from Apex. Uh, we'll have a chance for question and answers. And if you have questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to type them in chat. And we, uh, Stephen and, and John have assured us that um, we can go ahead and, and have questions during the presentation uh, as well as at the end. So as you think of those questions, please feel free to let us know what they are. So today our presenters are going to be John Selvage and Steve Frizzell from Apex. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John to say a few words, and then we'll turn it over to Steve for the presentation. So John, go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, my name is John Selvage, and I'm the current president of, of Apex Software. We're the makers of Axiom Intelligent Archives software, which is currently in use in several state archives around the U.S. Uh, Apex has been a, a proud sponsor of COSA for seven years now, and we're really looking forward to continuing that relationship on into the future. Uh, as for me personally, uh, I've been in this role as president of, of Apex Software for about a year and a half now. Uh, so I, I can't really refer to myself as the new guy anymore, but it's really been my privilege to uh, to meet with with archivists across the country, and I, I really look forward to uh, uh, to meeting with everyone in the next year or two as the opportunity presents itself. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, by Steve Frizzell, as Lisa said, and he's the past president of Apex Software and the chief architect of the Axiom product. Uh, Steve has graciously agreed to step out of semi retirement uh, to talk to us today, so. Thank you very much, Steve. And with that, I'd like to uh, turn things over to Steve. So, Steve. Thank you, John. Let's see if I can get control of here. Okay. As John mentioned, for uh, about the last six or seven years, Apex Software has been a uh, sponsor of the COSA organization, and we have been actively involved with supporting state archives, various state archives for even longer than that, with software for managing their, their holdings. I'm sure that by now most of you have at least heard of the name Apex Software or maybe have heard the name Axiom with regard to our software product. Uh, but, but many of you may not know exactly what that product does. And, and so the, the purpose of this webinar and the other webinars that we've previously done is to help familiarize you with the capabilities of the Axiom product. Of course, you know, we hope that you'll see something there that, that you may find useful in an organization. Previously, we, we did a session on managing uh, state agencies, and we talked about all the capabilities we have in that regard. We also did a session on maintaining uh, your record schedules. I believe both of those presentations are online if you want to go back and review them at some time in the future when we have the time. Today, we're going to focus on managing your permanent archival holdings of Axiom. Obviously, that's an important part of what an archive does. Um, you know, we have record center software, and we have a lot of other things that Axiom can do, but probably the most important thing we can do is, is help you manage your holdings. Today, we're going to talk about seven or eight different aspects or functions that are found in Axiom. I've divided them into two categories. One of them is describing your archival holdings. And the other one is managing your inventory of archival records. If you look at this category, you'll see that under the describing category, we have the ability to have hierarchical record descriptions, create an online searchable catalog of all your holdings. We can create your finding aids and publish them to the web. And we can uh, 
manage and facilitate the processing of your records. In the area of inventory management, we allow the accessioning of records into the archive. Um, less frequently, you may have a need to decession records, so we have a workflow for that. The inventory management area, we also allow a hierarchical container management. That means we can have containers within containers. For example, a box may have folders within it that you want to describe. And then we can maintain, uh, we can do space management, keep track of your shelving, your cabinets, and space that's available, and what's in all of them. So this is what we're going to focus today on these eight categories. The next slide. Um, shows you other functions that are also in Axiom. We're not going to talk about these today, but I included this slide uh, just so you could see how comprehensive Axiom really is. And this isn't even a complete list. So if you, if you look down this list, you'll see that there's quite a few additional areas of functionality that could be brought into play to help you manage your archival holdings. So let's start with the first category in record descriptions for the four areas uh, that I identified there. First area is the hierarchical record descriptions. I mentioned that they're hierarchical, and we do use the EAD hierarchy for describing records. Uh, so you could you could describe your, your uh, state state records using record groups and series within record groups and subseries or whatever hierarchy is applicable to your particular organization. Some organizations simply describe everything as series, so they don't really use a hierarchy, but they just use the series to describe their records. The system can accommodate either. I think, you know, I think a lot of the archives still use just a series, but as they get used to the idea of having a hierarchy, they really like it. We also allow uh, your records to be identified using multiple IDs. So if you currently um, identify your records using all numbers or some other identifying number, um, if you were to move to Axiom, you could still keep those same IDs. You know, we assign identifiers to the records, but, uh, but we support any number of other identifiers as well for locating identifying records. Every, every record uh, has to have a creating entity. In case of the state archive, that's usually a state agency or a board or a commission or a judicial, uh, it could be uh, a judicial agency, something like that. But every every series or every uh, record that you describe will have a creating entity associated with it. In your record descriptions, you can enter as many notes as you want, um, and they all follow the EAD standard. So as you know, if you're familiar with EAD, you know that there's a wide variety of note types that are supported, including abstract, spoken content, arrangement, and so forth. As part of your record description, we also allow you to um, summarize the extent information. So the system can use the extent information that you enter for calculating the total extents that you have in your holdings, or it can calculate the extent information from the containers themselves. Most of your records will also have a date range. So you may have uh, uh, land records from 1800 through 1850. And so each record description is going to identify the range of dates that are applicable to that particular series or that particular record. It will allow you to define access points, which can be used for classifying or searching your records. Access points can be based on local subject headings or on Library of Congress subject headings. It need to be simple, which means that they involve only one or single subject heading, or it can be complex, have up to five subject headings combined to, to create a, a single access point. Each record description can also have use and access restrictions that are defined so that you can see right away uh, if a record is, is restricted in some way or only allowed to be used for certain purposes. Records also have privacy classifications. They can be public, private, confidential. And we use those, those various classifications to decide whether or not they should be included in the catalog or not, and whether or not uh, finding aids should include them. 
So the system does use uh, these classifications to help keep confidential information within the archive and not necessarily exposed to the public. And of course, the record descriptions are fully integrated with the rest of the system. So if you're looking at a series record, you may see that it's associated with uh, session records, deaccession records, uh, record center transfers, microfilm work orders. You'll see containers that are in your holdings that have been associated with that series and even electronic records. So the Axiom system is a fully integrated system that but the information that you enter in one part of the system is almost always accessed in other parts of the system as well. This screenshot illustrates a uh, possible hierarchy of, of uh, records. If you, if you can see it, it starts with a collection at the top level. Then the second level is series, and the third level are subseries. If you look a little closer, you'll see that each subseries, uh, depending on the series, uh, can uh, represent different categories, different date ranges, or different counties. Uh, so there's different entities associated with the record. So in this case, uh, you know, the subseries is used to very effectively to break down a series into a finer level of detail. This screen shows the file maintenance program that's used to maintain your record descriptions. Across the top, you see that there are six different tabs. Each tab will change the form that's displayed and will expose different information to the user relating to a particular record that's being described. In this case, we're looking at a collection level record. This screen, which is the identity screen, you see that we have a title, we have a creator identified in the middle of the screen there. A little farther down, you see a date expression, which identifies a date range that the records span. And on the bottom, you see an extent summary, which shows that we have uh, entered extent of 252 boxes, but the actual extent that was calculated is 132 feet. So this is just a representative sample of the way screens look when you uh, maintain information in This is uh, a screenshot really from an earlier presentation. This is uh, this shows the hierarchy of agencies. Uh, if you look in the middle of the screen, you'll see the AGB, the Board of Agriculture, and then you see that it has uh, second level uh, agencies or departments and then third level as well. So we have the Department of Agriculture, which has a division of animal industry, and then has cattle crossings, cattle dips, sites, and so forth. So this illustrates how uh, we use a hierarchy, not only for the record descriptions, but also for the creators that are associated with those record descriptions. This, uh, this is a screenshot here that shows that for a particular, in this case, subseries, subseries number 1533, we have one container that's associated with that subseries. It's a letter box, and you can see the container ID. It's highlighted there as PC-1716.1. So this is an example of how other information is linked to, the, in this case, the subseries record description in Axiom. So once you've spent a, a lot of time uh, describing your records, th there are benefits that pay off from that. One of the, the biggest one is that the system will create an online searchable catalog for you based on all of your record descriptions. The searchable catalog is a web, a web page that, uh, that the public can access. Incorporates the solar search engine, if you're familiar with that, it's an open source search engine, similar in, uh, functionality to the type of searches that you can do with Google. So we can do a keyword search of all of the fields of information that we have uh, describing our records. So all of the notes are indexed. Uh, all of the things like titles, dates, they're all indexed and they're all searchable using the search engine on the catalog. 
can also support uh, filtering of results by facets. So we have facets, for example, might be uh, the type of agency, or it might be a date range, or or a record category, something like that. I'll show you a sample of the screen in just a minute. We also um, can filter by specific field values. So if you wanted to um, search for a phrase that was within the title field, do that. If you wanted to search for records that were specific to one individual agency, you can do that. Once you get a, a list of hits from your search, they're displayed on the screen, and you can drill down to see more detailed information for each of the hits that are displayed. You can also link to the actual finding aid that you created that might be associated with that series or with the record that search found. If you're interested in actually seeing a live catalog that's online right now, North Carolina has their DOC catalog, which is part of their Axiom system. You can go to that URL that I've got there, archives.ncpcr.gov slash search dash doc. And type in a couple searches and get an idea of how it works. Click on some of the links and see um, what it can do for you. Steve, we have a, a question in the chat from, uh, from Dennis Best. And Dennis is wondering, uh, is the software client server or is it SaaS? Yeah, Dennis, um, we can actually configure the system to be either way. If you have your own server, we can install it on your server and you can access it from your desktops using our client software. Or if you prefer, we can provide a hosted solution. And you would simply use your desktops uh, in your web browser to access the system and we would provide it as a service. So that we can configure it to, uh, to go either way depending on the requirements of your IT department and the needs of archive. So this screenshot is um, a sample from the North Carolina catalog. Typed in a, a search for highway signs. It came up with 15 hits. You can see the first three of them listed there before they got cut off. But they're sorted by relevance. So, so the solar search engine has a uh, different weights that are assigned to different types of records and fields. So it comes up with a value that determines the relevance order. And over on the left-hand side, you can see some of the facets there, the type of creator, the, the date of the record, um, the end date for the records, the end date for the records, and then the bibliographic level series or subseries or record group in this case. So I would encourage you to go to the uh, North Carolina site and give this a try, just to uh, familiarize yourself with how the online catalog uh, could work. So pretty much as important as having a catalog is having finding aids that can be created from the system. And we do just that. We create the finding aids for you from your record descriptions. We have a, a little subsystem that actually manages the creation and the publishing of your finding aids. They're published on demand, so anytime you go in and make changes to a series or to a record description, um, once you've completed your changes, then you can put a finding aid module for that record, and you can publish a new revision of the finding aid. When you do that, we create an EAD XML file, so it's a standard uh, EAD file. We also create an HTML finding aid web page using that EAD XML file and, and the style sheet uh, along with the third party product called Saxon, which Saxon, if you're not familiar with it, can take a style sheet and an XML file and create HTML. So this all happens automatically. So when you click on the button that says, I want to publish, they ask you, um, do you want to preview it? So you can preview the XML file and you can preview the HTML web page that is your finding aid. Take a look at it. And if something isn't quite right, you might go back and correct it or fix an misspelling or whatever the issue is and then preview it again. So, so you have an opportunity to make sure that it's right before you publish it. 
once you're satisfied that it, that it is uh, ready to publish, then you tell it to go ahead and publish it. When it does, it will post that HTML file to the web server and it will become accessible to the public. Point. We do support multiple uh, style sheets, so um, you can have different formats for your finding age depending on the types of records. So if, you, uh, if you're an archive that has state records, you may have one style of, a, of finding aid for your state records. And if you happen to have private collections, um, those finding aids might look totally different and have a different style sheet that controls the formatting of them. So we do support multiple style sheets. Choose which uh, style sheet is applicable when you create the uh, finding aid. We keep a history of every revision of the finding aid as well. So even if you do publish it and find out that it's not right, you can very easily by clicking a button revert back to the previous revision of the finding aid. Fix your problem, publish it again. So that's really a handy feature. This gives you a lot of control over managing and publishing your finding aids. And it really simplifies the whole process because it's, it's almost totally automatic in terms of Picking your record descriptions and creating a really nice web page to uh, your finding aid information. This is a uh, screenshot of the top part of one of North Carolina's finding aids. You can see they've. This is the format they chose using uh, their style sheet. Yours could be different depending on. The style sheet you want it to be presented. But it's a fairly classical presentation with an abstract at the top and then some description there in the middle. You see that there's a title and a call number and a creator and record range, date, date, a range of dates for the records, extent information. And then, then it starts in with some other uh, notes that have been entered, citation information, uh, overview, and you can see the beginning of an arrangement note heading there. Uh, it goes on through the various notes. You can't see it on this screenshot, but it also includes, uh, if it's a, it's a collection that has series and subseries, it'll, it'll uh, show that hierarchy farther down the page. And it will also include the actual containers uh, that you have in your inventory for each of these series and subseries. That are part of this finding aid. If you do go to the catalog and click on one of the finding aid links, you can see one of these finding aids, and you can see the entire finding aid, and see what it looks like. So if you do go to the uh, North Carolina catalog, make sure you click on the finding aid link. Look at the finding. So the final category. Um, under the record description areas, it's probably is more of a inventory management, but it's the processing of records. And so we've added some some nice features into the system to help you manage the processing of your records. So essentially, what you can do is you can tag your containers with pending tasks. So when you receive containers into the archive, if you know you're going to have to rebox them, or you're going to have to clean them, or label them, or flatten them, or whatever the task is. You can assign those tasks to those containers as soon as you identify that the task needs to be done. And maybe months later, or even years later, you can come back and you can say, okay, I'm ready to finally rebox all these things. And you can uh, do a search and find all the pending tasks for a series uh, or all the rebox tasks for a series for a particular agency or whatever the search criteria is. The system will find all of the ones that you're looking for and create a work order for you list all the containers for you and allow you to uh, go through and, and update each container as you perform those tasks. So the, the whole idea is that we're just helping you manage the, um, the workflow for, for completing various tasks associated with the container. Then, of course, you have a history of what tasks you've actually formed on each container. So we know that you reboxed it or you relabeled it or one of the special types of tasks that we support is splitting and merging of containers. 
And so you can use this program to also take one container and split it into multiple containers. So you can take two containers and split it into three containers, or you can merge containers. So you might take three containers and merge them into one or merge them into two. So any, any combination of splitting and merging is supported by the system. This gives you the ability to, to go through and maybe as you weed uh, records out of the box and you don't need two boxes, maybe you only need one box, so you can easily merge those two boxes into one. In the inventory, you end up with one box in the inventory. The original two boxes, in that example, are still there, but they're marked as having been merged and they're no longer active, no longer counted in your extents. So we do keep a history of uh, all the tasks for every container. We know the status of the task, when it was scheduled, when it started, when it was completed, who did it, and any notes that might have been added that were relevant to that task. And of course, we can produce um, statistics for you showing how many each task you performed by month or by quarter or by year. And that can be important or useful um, trying to justify your existence and get more money in the budget. You can say, well, you know, we, we process this many boxes, get this many tasks, and so forth. So the processing uh, capability can really help you manage that whole process. This is just a sample screenshot of, of a, a task associated with one container. Container type is a cubic foot box, and this is a, a folder task. Looks like some of the fields weren't entered, but basically it was started on one date, completed, was assigned to user QF, and it's still in process. All right, so let's talk about inventory management. We have to be able to keep track of all of your holdings, your physical holdings, the boxes, the other uh, artifacts that you have in your archive. Maybe reels of microfilm. Maps, it could be any type of any type of records or artifacts that you maintain in your archive it can be kept in the inventory. But in the inventory, we call everything a container. That's a generic term. Container can be a box, a real microphone, a map in that case, it be a folder, it be an item in a folder. So a container is a generic term that represents some unit of so one of the most common things that we do is we accession records into the inventory, into the archives. The accession transaction in Axiom provides you with a historical record of materials that are accessioned into the archive. So every time you bring records into the archive from any source, you would want to create an accession transaction to record that activity. So you see there are some of the sources for an accession could be that we, we automatically create an accession transaction when records are transferred from the record center. So if, if uh, records are in the record center and after 10 years are supposed to be transferred to the archives uh, for permanent uh, holding, and disposition processing capability of the record center software will create an accession transaction to record that transfer from the record center to the archives. We can also uh, create an accession transaction if you, fit, if you create microfilm reels that are going to the archives inventory. Microfilm work order system gives you the ability to create microfilm reels that, that maybe, uh, maybe create them for the agency them when you go into the record center inventory, or maybe they go to the archive, or maybe they go into the research room. It's there. So we so we create the reels of microfilm and they become they go into the inventory and we create an accession transaction from the microfilm work order to record those, those reels of microfilm being transferred to the archives. You can also manually enter accessions for records that are received from many sources. So agencies send you records directly. You can enter a session transaction to record the receipt of them. You could also, if you have collections you get from private donors, you can use the accession entry program to uh, 
record those records. When you enter in a session transaction, you're describing what you have received. You're going to identify the series or the, or the record description uh, for those materials. And you're also going to create container records. And so if you received five boxes from an agency, you're going to create a session transaction. You're going to say it has five boxes. You're going to create five container records in the archive inventory for those five boxes. That's all part of the accession interview program. And it does also calculate the extent information for those new materials that are in accession into the archives inventory. This screenshot shows uh, what the accession entry screen looks like. You can see that uh, there's an identifier and the session ID and then repository is identified. So if you have multiple locations or uh, branches, you can identify which branch you were accessioned into. You identify the series record, uh, the creator, and the title. You can also classify the records uh, by class and subclass, or even by geographic location and subgeo. Um, you can attach various notes. You can put in a range of dates that the records span. And you can also enter uh, extent information or system calculate extent information for you. In this case, in material summary, you see there's 13 containers that are being accessioned. The date they were received, and they represent 11 cubic feet of the extent. Buttons on the right that are highlighted uh, tell you that there's additional information that can be accessed behind those buttons. So we can see that there's 13 container records we could look at by clicking on that button. Look at the extent information in more detail by clicking on the container extent information and so forth. This screen shows a little more information about the extents on the same session. We see that those 13 containers were actually two folders and 11 cubic foot boxes. The calculated extents is basically a cubic foot for each box and no cubic feet for the folders. So the folders that were set up in the system did not have any extent information associated with it. Normally, they would have some type of extent information. It might be a fraction of a cubic foot, but might have some number that you associate with a folder. So, these sessions are uh, just the opposite of a session. You're getting rid of records. You no longer need them in the archive for whatever reason. Maybe the uh, schedule changed. They're no longer to be kept in the archive. Uh, so, you need to deaccession them, dispose of them. So we have a, a, a transaction for doing that. There's also an approval workflow built into that to uh, make sure that you go through the proper approval process for deaccessioning and destroying, potentially destroying records. They don't have to be destroyed. They could be returned to the donor. They can be returned to the agency. Uh, so the disposition of the records isn't always destruction. It could be some other disposition. When you're creating the deaccession transaction, you can select containers by series or by agency or by original accession ID brought into the archives ID. Once you identify the containers, we print a pull report so they can go and someone can pull those containers from the shelves and stage them for disposition. This is a sample screen of what the deaccession transaction looks like. And you may notice that it's very similar to the accession screen. It's the same basic information. The only difference is we're removing these items from the inventory. So we do identify, in this case, the five containers that are being deaccessioned. Those containers will still be in the inventory file after the deaccession is completed, but they'll be marked as having been deaccessioned along with information relating to the deaccession. And they'll no longer be counted in the extents that are in your inventory. But the history of those containers never goes away. It stays in the system forever. The inventory part of the system maintains the containers. It's just the actual inventory of the boxes, the inventory of the map cases, the inventory of 
whatever whatever type C records you have. Um, mentioned earlier, we support containers within containers. So you may define uh, a box container, maybe as a cubic foot box, and within that you may have containers which are folders, and within each folder you might have another level of detail, which would be containers, uh, maybe items. So you can define the different container types, and you can define the applicable hierarchies. It's totally up to you whether you use a hierarchy of containers, and if you do, what that hierarchy consists of. You also define all your container types. So uh, the map, map cases, and the Hollinger boxes, the Fibrex boxes, whatever type of containers you need, you can define those in the container type file, and you can enter the applicable extent information for those containers. We also support user-defined format types, format such as paper, 16 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film, CDs, DVDs, any type of uh, media or format of records can be defined format. Each container can have multiple container IDs. And so again, if you identify a container by a call number or by some kind of container ID number, you can continue to use those with access. The container also has a description, has a date, date range for the contents of the container, has arrangement information. So you can say that it's arranged by last name from A to M, that kind of thing. Use restrictions associated with the container. And you can have a variety of notes associated with the container as well. We can print the labels for your container. So we can print labels for boxes. We can print labels for microfilm reels or labels for anything you want. Different sizes and shapes of labels, different formats. They can have barcodes because we do support barcoding. So we, we have probably a dozen different predefined label formats and we can pretty easily add additional formats if you need something different. One of the most important things we do is we track each container. We know where that container is all the time. If it's been checked out and gone to the research room, we know that. If it's checked out and is in processing, we know that. We know everywhere it's been. Of course, the, the benefit of that is if you if you later determine that records have been damaged or somehow misplaced, you can go back to the person who had them and try to identify what happened. So you do have a complete history of every time the container moves from the shelf. And when it goes when it is checked out, it goes back to the same spot of the shelf. That, spot is retained for that container unless you later decide to move the container somewhere else. The container uh, inventory is fully integrated with the rest of the system. So every container is going to be related to a series record or a bibliographic record at some level. It is possibly going to be associated with a schedule. Could have a record center transfer associated with it. Could have an accession transaction associated with it. They have a deaccession transaction. They can have a microfilm work order. So when you're looking at a container, if you see that it's that it has a series associated with it, which it will, you can you can click on a button and jump straight to that series and see all the information about that series as well as any other containers that might be associated with that series. And then you can return right back to the container again after you've done that. So the system allows you to drill down and return back to where you were. And you'll find that capability throughout the system. This is uh, an example of a two-level container. It's truly a container within a container because somehow both levels are called containers. But <laughs> I'm, uh, we probably could have chosen a better example. I think probably we just didn't know what the container types were, so we just used a generic container in this, this, this particular case. As you can see that uh, we have a description for the containers. We also have uh, location codes in terms of where we can find them, which shelf and which stack, which row and bay. And, uh, from the screen, by the way, you can drill down and see the full screen of detail for the container. That's what this screen shows you. This shows you 
lot of the information that we, that we keep for each container. This happens to be a top level container. When you see the container type that's highlighted, it says letterbox. So this is a letterbox. It contains the media type is mixed materials. And the extent is one cubic foot. Um, you can see it's in the archive custody. We don't have dates. So we don't know when it went into the custody, but it is. It has an ID number of PC.1716.1. It's description information. It has a history of changes that have been made. In this case, there's no location information, so this container, we don't know where it is at this point. No date, date range, so there's a lot of missing information on this particular container record. Most of your container records would have more complete information. This one has no records of a transfer, no archive session, does have a uh, subseries number associated with it, does have an entity or an agency. So this is this is representative of the type of information that we store for each individual container in the system. This screen is similar, but this one, if you look at the title, it says microphone information. So this, there's some sections of this screen that are different because they have fields for real number, film size, film type, film use, camera. So there's some additional information here that relates specifically to the fact that it's a microfilm container. This is a screen showing some of the container types that you might define. Look, you'll see, uh, for example, folders, fireworks boxes, microfish, digital records, digital bag. So there's a variety, and then there's, there's more that you don't see, of course. This is just the first screen. And you see the extent information under the volume columns. You can see the standard extent information that we use to calculate the extents for each of these types of uh, containers. This screen shows some of the record formats. So you can see books, blueprints, compact disks, microfish, film scripts, all kinds of things that you probably don't use at all today. Maybe you have in the archive somewhere. So you can uh, you can define any type of format type that you need for the types of materials that you have in your archive. This is just a sample report showing a barcode on it. This is actually a thick list for checking in boxes and putting them back on the shelf. So this is showing you where, where the box goes here, the floor, the row, the column, the shelf, the spot on the shelf, even spot number three on the shelf. Uh, and then the barcode. So when they reshelve these, they can scan the barcode. In the area of space management, we, we allow you to define the configuration of your storage areas and your storage space. So we use a three level hierarchy for buildings, rooms within buildings, and areas within rooms. And it's up to you to define how many buildings you need to, the rooms that are in them. You can also define different types of storage that you have. So you might have stack storage, you might have movable stack storage, or compact storage, you could have index card cabinets, you can have standard four door filing cabinets, you can have map, map cases, uh, all kinds of storage types. So you define all storage types that you have in the storage type file. Then you can also define the storage systems. And type is generic, a system is an instance of that type. So if you define a, a four door filing cabinet as a type, you might have 50 of those cabinets. Each of them is a storage system. We also keep track of the capacity of each shelf. So if you have a shelf for in the, the stacks, uh, and each shelf is uh, allows if you're using, let's say, cubic foot boxes, uh, could have maybe four across and two deep and two high. You can specify that in the system so it'll know the configuration of that shelf for that type of container. So you do identify uh, the type of container that you expect to put on a shelf. You can also stipulate that only that type of container can go on that shelf, or you can say any type of container can go on the shelf, even though you specify a default. 
container type. As long as you uh, put the same type of container on the shelf, the system knows how many fit. But once you start mixing and matching, then sometimes uh, the system may think there's room for another box when there may not be, depending on how big the box is or the shape of the box. So, uh, so we do keep track of the shelf and the arrangement um, of containers on the shelf, layout of them, keep track of if you want to keep track of where on the shelf the box is eaten. So we have a very comprehensive inventory management system that's fully integrated with the descriptions that you create for your records. This is a, uh, a sample of an available space report. To simply list um, shelves that have empty spaces on them. Tells you where they are and how many spaces are available. The type of container that the shelf is designated for. So that concludes the slideshow. So we have a, another question down there. So does your software work equally well for a digital record center? Where records would not be maintained in boxes on warehouse shelves, but in file structures on data servers. Um, the system is designed to accommodate digital records, but we have not yet completed all of the programming that's needed to fully implement support for digital records. You can accession digital records in the archive, and you can specify that just accessioned in. Uh, a certain number of gigabytes or megabytes or kilobytes of records and bag of uh, bag, bag or but uh, and we do create a container for that but we don't have the ability to link to the actual digital records yet we have the, the fields to do it we just haven't finished implementing the capability yet but we do expect to have that later this year that's, uh, I think that's next on our list of things to finish implementing. So um, we will be able to uh, to do that. We will also be implementing a work order management system for creating digital records. So just as uh, we have a work order management system for creating microfilm reels, we would have a similar work order process for digitizing records. Of course, once they're digitized, then we would be able to create the applicable container records, associate them with the appropriate series, and have links to the actual digital images themselves. So uh, we are moving in that direction very quickly, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, are there any other questions? Well, while everyone's typing their questions in, hopefully I've got one for you, Steve. Okay. Um, uh, I was really pleased to see that there was a a hierarchy when when you talk about the organizations that you received uh, records from. Um, what I'm wondering, because we all know that governments like to reorganize themselves, um, is there a way? Let's say the Department of Agriculture reshifts um, how they organize things, and so. Uh, things are now in a different subcategory. Is it possible to reorganize uh, the hierarchy of your organizations as well? Or yes, so that's very possible. You can move you can move a uh, subdivision of a department to another department uh, very easily by simply changing the, the parent organization that it's associated with. And then those right. records those records follow that agency. Uh, so they stay with the original agency in that case, or the, the subdivision of the agency. Great, thanks. Um, uh, are there any other questions for Steve? I mean, um, oh, and I was just curious. Um, I, I really like that there is um, that if you deaccession something, there's still a notation that it did used to exist. Um, is there a way, let's say you accession something and it really didn't even belong in the system. Where if you, is there a way of, of purging it as opposed to deaccessioning it so that. Um, uh, we don't have a specific function to allow that, but I won't say that it can't be done. Okay. 
it's a behind the scenes capability that we could expose if, if it was needed. Um, but that would be kind of an exceptional, in, in our opinion. We actually do have an administrator menu you can go to. You can actually delete records rather than DSF in them. Great. Yeah. Only, only, only someone with administrator privileges would be able to do that. As it should be, because we certainly don't want just anybody going in and just willy nilly deleting records and containers. So, but that's great. Um, I'm not seeing any other comments or questions at this point. Um, and so I would like to thank you, Steve and John for uh, being uh, presenters for us today. Um, I'm going to ask. I know Barbara is on. Barbara, would you like to say anything while we're. Um, as we finish up today's presentation. Give her a um, second there. I really just appreciate Steve and John for being here and Steve for giving us such a good overview. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome, Barbara. It's good to, good to hear from you again. I don't see your picture, but I hear your voice. That's almost as good. <laughs> I don't think you want to see my picture today. <laughs> okay. That's one of the nice things about video conferences. You can right. be public or not. <laughs> There was one other question I see on there. It says, do I have a target date for when uh, the digital record might be implemented? I, I would say look for it by the end of the year. We don't have a specific date yet that we've set for completing that particular project, but I would expect by around the end of the year, we would have that capability in place. Great. Um, Steve, thank you again. John, have, do you have any other comments closing that you'd like to make uh, uh, as, as for our presentation? Uh, not exactly. I just uh, uh, once again want to thank uh, COSA for giving us the opportunity to uh, uh, present this webinar today. So thank you all very much. Well, we appreciate you guys for doing that for us. And I'd just like to remind the attendees that uh, COSA continues to offer webinars on different topics uh, throughout the year in various formats. And we have our member webinar coming up May 27th, and it's going to be on conscious editing. So we hope you'll look forward to that as well. Uh, of course, there's always lots of ways to communicate with COSA, and we hope you'll take advantage of all of them. And uh, with that, uh, as you leave, there'll be a webinar evaluation, and we hope you'll take a moment and just respond, because that really does help all of us as we prepare future webinars and future shop talks. So again, thank you, uh, John and Steve, for a wonderful presentation today. We appreciate your time and your expertise and knowledge and taking the time to share that with us. So thank you everyone for attending today, and I hope we'll see you all at the next Tacosa event. Take care, everyone. <laughs>